On July 31st, 1908, a contract letter was signed in the Belfast shipyards of the Olympic, the Titanic, and a third sister ship to follow. On March 31st, 1909, Achilles laid down in Harland and Wolfyard number 401. Construction of the Titanic had begun. features made the Titanic. Virtually unsinkable. Here's the Titanic watch margin, sir. Virtually? Virtually? Look here, Cartwright, the man in the street don't use words like virtually, no, no, no. Here's your headline. Titanic, unsinkable. World Titanic Star Ship, unsinkable. Special. Titanic World Star Ship, unsinkable. May 31st, 1911. Launch day. A red flag is hoisted on Titanic stand given notice that the launch will soon take place. A rocket is fired into the air while the ships in the room stand clear. Workmen are removing wooden blocks around the hull. The cry goes up. Stand clear! Swarms of men rush out from below the hull. One man, James Dobbins, was using a sword to cut away one of the wooden supports. As it broke, it collapsed. Hitting his leg underneath, his work being dragged him away from the ships.
one six feet nine inches by two feet nine inches and one six feet four inches by four feet three inches. This room to have a settee vogel table in front, a three foot dressing table and chair, and electric heater, the floor to be laid with blue carpet. The sitting room by A. Heaton and Company to have a round table in the centre of the room with two armchairs, two ordinary chairs, a sideboard, a cabinet, a corner writing table or chair, two of the lounge chairs, a fireplace and an octagonal coffee stool. Twelve rooms to have furniture in oak marked A design. Fourteen rooms to have furniture in oak with draft beds marked B design. Six rooms to be Adam style and white. Four rooms to be Louis the Sixteenth style in oak. Two rooms to be Louis the Fifteenth style in grey. Two rooms to be Empire style in white. Two rooms, one port, one starboard at the fore end of this accommodation to be in mahogany. For the first and second class galley, four steam jackets stock it. Eighty pounds of capacity made of the best pan cast metal with banjo, <coughs> machine faced and jointed with countersunk bolts and nuts, polished iron circular top with polished moulding, panished copper, hinged cover, tinned inside and fitted with polished brass hinges and brass mounted handle. Bells, 123 inch diameter of brass shapes bell for four castle and four mast, one nine and a half inch diameter of brass shapes bell for captain's bridge, and one seventeen inch diameter of brass shapes bell for lookout cage and four mast. During January 1912, 16 wooden lifeboats were installed onto Titanic's boat deck, not the 32 boats specified by the original designer. The first proposal, however, had been for 64 lifeboats. So many lifeboats were spoiled the elegant lines of the vessel. Besides, the sight of such a quantity made people think that the ship was unsafe. Under the Border Trade Regulations and the Merchant Shipping Act, 1894, we are required to provide 9,622 cubic feet of lifeboat capacity. The 16 wooden lifeboats will carry approximately 960 passengers. It will tend to be certified by the Board of Trade to carry a total of 3,547 passengers and crew. To accommodate this number of people would require 63 lifeboats. On April 2nd, 1912, Titanic undertook her sea trials. At 2 p.m., Titanic travelled about 40 miles out into the Irish Sea and then returned. A journey of four hours. Board of Trade representatives were satisfied. The plans for this vessel, the largest in the world, lasted less than a day. At 8 p.m. that day, Titanic left Belfast and headed to Southampton, her port of embarkation. April 5th, 1912, Good Friday. Titanic is dressed in flags and pennants as a salute to the people of Southampton. Southampton was a port hungry for work. Easter Saturday, April 6th, White Star Line announced they would be taking on crew. The response was enthusiastic. With their precious seamen's book and certificate of continuous discharge in their work hard hands, seamen, stokers, trimmers, greasers, and others filled the union's ports and company of hiring rooms. Most were from Southampton, with the promise of wages again after a long coal strike, which had brought the port to a standstill for almost six months. There were to be celebrations in many homes this Easter. Guess who's going on a maiden voyage? Guess who's earning top rate? Get off to the butchers, I want the best mints he's got. Mum, Mum, they took me on, they took me on. I'm on the Titanic. I'm going to be a bellboy, Mum. They'll give me a uniform. I might get to meet some first-class passengers. Well, you've fallen on your feet. You're 14 years old. You've just left school and you've got a job on the Titanic. Well, 
what job did you get? Well, I was in the queue and I um, met Jack Arkwright. You know, Jack, we had seen each other for years, so we went and had a little drink. And when I got back, all the jobs had gone. The first chance of work in months in you. I'll never forgive you for this. It's the worst mistake you've ever made in your life. And mine was marrying you! It would be good to get back to work, especially aboard a brand new liner, and one commanded by E.J. Smith, a captain whom the cream of Southampton seamen sailed. The well-respected captain was due to retire after taking Titanic on their maiden voyage. At 62 years of age, this was to be a fitting end to a distinguished career. April 7th, 1912, Easter Sunday. All was quiet on the docks. No smoke or steam rose from Titanic's bottles which had dominated the skyline. Monday, April 8th, saw a hectic consumption of activity. General cargo had already been loaded. Now, with only three days to go before sailing, fresh supplies began to arrive by train to be loaded into the spacious refrigerators on G-Deck. Fresh meat, 75,000 pounds. 75,000 pounds fresh meat. Fresh fish, 11,000 pounds. 11,000 pounds fresh fish. Bacon half, 7,500 pounds. 7,500 pounds of bacon and ham. Poultry and game, 25,000 pounds. 25,000 pounds poultry and game. Fresh eggs, 40,000 pounds. 40,000 fresh eggs. Tea, 100 pounds, 100 pounds tea. Coffee, 2,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds coffee. Beer and stouts, 20,000 bottles. Wines, 1,500 bottles. Mineral waters, 15,000 bottles. Spirits, 800 bottles. I don't know if I entirely agree with that figure. Yes, well. 800 is it? Cigars. 8,000. It seems to be all we'll carry on. Wednesday, April 10th, sailing day. At 7.30 a.m., Captain Edward J. Smith boards Titanic with a full crew. 8 a.m., the entire crew is mustered followed by a brief lifeboat drill. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. Titanic from the 
dock and into the river Test. There was a tremor as the huge bronze boat began to turn. Slowly, the Titanic's bow began to cut through the water. As Titanic passed by birth 38, a huge surge of water she created caused the vessel New York to rise and fall violently, snapping her mooring lines and allowing her to drift free. New York stern swung out, was heading for a collision with the Titanic. Captain Smith saw the danger. Engines full of stern! Stand by the anchor! Just four feet between them, the top of the bulk of the two ships were climbing. Titanic's departure was delayed by over an hour. When all ships were again secure, the Titanic was seen and proceed. Once again, she made her way out of the docks, and it's more slowly, more cautiously. <coughs> Titanic arrived off the port of Cherbourg, the sky was awash with the reds, blues and yellows of a fine spring sunset. At 6.30pm, she disembarked 22 cross-channel passengers and took on board 274 new passengers, 142 first, 30 second and 102 third class passengers. The third class continental passengers were a mixture of Syrians, Croatians, Armenians and other Middle East nationals. Their travel arrangements called for departure by the first available ship. They are pleased and surprised to find themselves aboard Titanic. Very few spoke English. Why, your accommodation is forward on G deck. Now, if you follow me, please. You follow me. Titanic's arrival was 1,385 sacks of mail, 7 second class and 113 third class passengers. Many of the third class passengers were trying to escape the poverty of Ireland and were in a new, more prosperous life in the United States of America. <laughs>
class were nonetheless comfortably off. They were managers, academics, small businessmen and professionals. One of their greatest pleasures was strolling along the open second class promenade deck. Taking the air up on the top, meeting new friends and neighbours, the orchestra plays our favourite tunes, dreaming of the life to come. Over the sea, baker and butcher, grocer and wife, all of them seeming hopeful, public and preacher, doctor and nurse, looking for a brand new start.
April 14, 1912, at 75 revolutions per minute, the propellers drove Titanic into smooth sea at 21 and a half knots. At 9 a.m., Titanic received a wireless signal from the vessel Coronia. Captain Titanic, westbound steamers report birds, growlers, and field ice. In 42 degrees north, 49 degrees, and 49 from 59 degrees west. April 12, compliments, bar. The message was delivered to Captain Smith, who posted it for his officers to read a note. At 1.42, a message from the Baltic. Greek steamer Athene reports passing icebergs and large quantities of field ice today in latitude 41 degrees 51 minutes north, longitude 49 degrees 52 minutes west, which showed Titanic walks success. The message was handed to Captain Smith when he was in conversation with Bruce Ismay. Smith handed the copy to Ismay, who put it in his pocket. Later, Ismay showed the message to several passengers. Mr. Ismay, we've heard talk of growlers. What is a growler? An iceberg stands out clear on the water. A growler is a low, flat section of ice. Dangerous? Oh, very. But not to us. <laughs> At 1.45, a private message from the liner America to Washington, D.C. was received and relayed by Titanic. America passed two large icebergs, 41 degrees, 27 minutes north, 50 degrees, 8 minutes west, and 8 walking. Since the message concerned navigation, it should have been sent to the bridge for attention. It was not. 5.30 p.m. Passengers taken more between decks noticed a change in air temperature. Between 5.30 and 7.30 p.m., the air temperature dropped 10 degrees to 33 degrees Fahrenheit, just one degree above freezing point. At 6 p.m., Second Officer Lightoller relieved Chief Officer Wild on the deck. At 7.30 p.m., a wireless message from Californian to Antillian was overheard by Titanic. To Captain, Antillian, 6.30 a.m. parent ship's time. Latitude 40 degrees 3 minutes north, longitude 49 degrees 9 minutes west. Three large bergs are south of us. Regards, Lord. I took the message to one of the officers in the bridge. Captain Smith was, was not personally advised for this latest ice message. He was in the a la carte restaurant, enjoying dinner, at a party given by Mr. and Mrs. George D. White. At 8.55pm, Captain Smith excuses himself from the dinner party. He went directly to the bridge. There's not much wind. No, it's a flat calm. It's a pity the wind <coughs> hasn't kept up with us as we're going through the ice region. The officers knew that in a calm sea there'd be no wind to break against the icebergs, making it easier for the lookouts to see. Spotting an iceberg on a dead calm moonless night such as this one was not going to be easy. If it becomes all doubtful, let me know at once. At 9.20, Captain Smith retired for the night. At 9.30, Officer Lightoller sent a message to the lookout, positioned in the crow's nest 50 feet up the forward mast. Keep an eye out for ice particles and growlers until daylight. Well, it would help if I had some binoculars. What happened to the binoculars anyway? <laughs> they had been left behind in a locker in Southampton. In the Marconi shack, operator Howard Bry had taken a nap. Now, senior operator Jack Phillips was alone and extremely busy, busy communicating private and commercial messages to the Cape Ray store station. At 9.4 he received a message from the vessel Misaba. From Misaba to Titanic, in latitude 42 degrees north to 41 degrees 25 minutes, longitude 49 degrees west to longitude 50 degrees 30 minutes west, from much heavy pack ice and a great number of large icebergs, also field ice. Weather good? Clear. Jack Phillips was too busy. The message never reached the bridge. At 10.30pm, the eastward bound freighter Rappahannock emerged from her passage through an extensive ice field during which she had sustained damage to her rudder. As her acting master, seeing Titanic's light beam, contacted her by a Morse signal lamp. Have just passed through heavy ice field and several icebergs. Reply, message received. Thank you, good night. Jack Phillips was hard at work in the Marconi room sending business and private messages to the radio station at Cape Race on behalf of the passengers. Stop to nice, some 19 miles north of Titanic's position, was the freighter to California. Signal all ships in the area, notifying of our position and situation. I'm not moving another inch in this dark with so much ice around. Aye, aye, sir. We are stopped, surrounded by ice. Keep out. Shut up. You're driving my signal. I'm working in Cape Race. Charming. I'm off to bed. The sound of seven bells marked 11.30 p.m. Sunday was almost over. The ice warnings Titanic had received during that day showed a picture of a huge ice field, some 78 miles long and 10 miles wide, which lay right in her path. 
months that no one had put them together. And still, Titanic was making its way through the ice-cold, dead, calm, starlit sea. French, do you see that haze up ahead? There's something. Three rings on the lookout bell. Object directly ahead. Iceberg right ahead, sir. Thank you. Iceberg right ahead. Engine stop. Full of stern, hard as dumb. As Titanic slowly changed course to port, he read the printed instructions posted near the helmsman. In case of emergency, to close watertight doors on tank top, press bell. Push for 10 seconds to give alarm, then move switch to on position and keep it there. He brought down the watertight doors, sealing all 15 watertight bunkheads, and waited. This prompt action had avoided a head on collision. Titanic swept past the side of the bird, but it ran past her, struck Titanic's underbelly on the starboard side, 12 feet above the keel. Opening a big gap to more than an inch wide, but extending some 300 feet. At the moment of impact, most people on board were completely unaware that anything else was to happen. Many were asleep. As they chatted, a faint grinding jar seemed to come from deep within the ship. It was not much, but enough to break the conversation and rattle the silver set for next morning's breakfast. I know what that is. We've thrown a propeller. You know what that means. Back to Highland and Wolf with plenty of time to enjoy the hospitality of the port. Another Belfast trip. In the galley, Chief Knight Baker, Walter Belford, went to pan a frick, fresh rolls, clatter off the oven and scatter on the floor. Mrs. E.D. Atherton felt hardly any shock at all, but noticed an unpleasant ripping sound. Like someone tearing a long, long strip of calico. Lady Cosmo Duff Gordon felt more of a jolt. As she awoke, she said it seemed as though somebody had drawn a giant finger down the side of the ship. In Boiler Room 6, leading fireman Frederick Barrett, his sound like thunder rolling towards him and is astonished to see water flowing through a gash in the side. The water side door closes in front of him and he uses an emergency ladder to escape. Thomas Andrews, Harlan the director, and his aunt on Titanic. He was so absorbed in his work that he noticed nothing until a knock on the door summoned him to the bridge. At 11.55 p.m., 15 minutes after the collision, the post office forward on G deck is already flooding. The postal clerks are struggling through two feet of water to save 200 pouches of registered mail. I watched as Thomas Andrews inspected the damage below decks and made some calculations. Water had risen 14 feet above the keel in the first 10 minutes. Titanic could stay afloat with any two of her 16 compartments completely flooded. She could even stay afloat with her first four compartments gone. But not with all five of her first compartments completely flooded. The ship was doomed. How long have we? An hour and a half, possibly two, or much longer. Yeah. 
Second officer Lightoller maintained the strict rule of women and children and two seamen per boat. On the starboard side, men had a luckier time. There, the policy was if no more women and children were available, their faces could be taken by men. As the Titanic began to sink at the bow, the situation became much more clearer and more alarming. Many touching scenes were observed. Mrs. Isidore Strauss almost entered boat number eight, but then turned back. We've been living together for many years. Where you go, I go. I'm sure no one would object to an old gentleman like you getting in. I will not go before the other men. We stay. Then they sat down together on a pair of deck chairs. Other wives refused to go. Mr. and Mrs. Lucy and Smith were having the same kind of argument. When Mrs. Lucy and Smith saw the captain standing by the side of the ship, she had an inspiration. Please, Captain, I'm all alone in this world. Please let my husband come with me. I'm sorry, madam. Women and children only. Never mind, Captain. I'll see if she gets in the boat. I never asked you to obey. But this one time you must. It's only a matter of form to have women and children first. The ship is thoroughly equipped and everyone on it will be safe. I agree completely truthful. 
Yes. Keep your hands in your pockets. It's very cold weather. Children. By 1.40am, most of the forward boats have gone, 
Bruce Ismay, President of the White Star Line, assists in helping collapsible sea for launch. When it is ready and no further passengers respond to Chief Officer World calls for women and children, he orders the boat to be lowered away. Collapsible sea is the last boat to leave the starboard side. And down below, third class passengers are still being held back by the rope reluctant to go through signs saying first class only beyond this point. And now streams of humanity poured up from below and surged into the stern of the vessel, which was still rising to the air. Captain Smith goes through the wires operators. It's every man for himself! Jack Phillips chooses to remain at his station, still sending the distress call. Captain Smith returns to the bridge where he stands alone as the cold waters of the Atlantic rush in. Band leader Wallace Henry Hartley taps his boat, ending the ragtime, and the band plays Nearer My God to Me.
greatest maritime disaster in history was too slow to reach, the public and initial reports were quite inaccurate. At their New York office, Philip A.S. Franklin, Vice President of the White Star Line, told reporters, We place absolute confidence in Titanic. We believe her to be unsinkable. Then word spread of the message Bruce Ismay had sent from Carpathia. Deep clear regret to advise, Titanic sank this morning. 15. After collision with iceberg, resulting in serious loss of life. Further particulars later. So Hampton quickly came to city in morning. Flags flew at half mast, and crowds gathered with almost every two quarters to assess the fearful event. In the districts of Northern and Shirley, nearly every able-bodied man followed the scene. A small boy called to our newspaper office on Wednesday. Had you any news of the crew of Titanic? No, I'm afraid we haven't. Do you think my brother was sick? He's 14 and started as a bellboy. I'm sorry, we don't know. All of Titanic's bellboys were lost. The first survivor list were posted on April 17th. In the ever-changing crowd outside the Canute Road offices were young women with babies. Babies who laughed and crowed in the sunlight while their mothers grieved with eyes which had known their sleep throughout the night. There were old women, some crying quietly, others seeking to comfort some of the daughters. What are we waiting for, Mummy? Why are we waiting for such a long time? We're waiting for news of Father, dear. <laughs> Ships hired by the White Star Line recovered a total of 328 bodies from the area surrounding the sinking. A total of 1,507 lives have been lost. On April the 19th, the United States Senate began an inquiry into the sinking. April 24th, as Titanic sister ship Olympic is leaving Southampton, her black gang, the Stokers, do you, went on strike. Yeah, we ain't working on a ship where don't have enough lifeboats for everyone. What happened to our mates on Titanic ain't going to happen to us. 285 crew deserted the ship. And the Olympics voyage had to be cancelled. Hooray! From May the 2nd to July the 3rd, British Border Trading Party was conducted. 25,622 questions were asked to 96 witnesses. Lord Mersey, who had led the inquiry, concluded. That the collision of the Titanic with the iceberg was due to excessive speed at which the ship was navigated, that the proper watch was not kept, that the ship's boats were properly lowered, but the arrangements of manning them were insufficient. Not one third-class passenger was called to testify. Let me also say that the inquiry shows that there was no discrimination against third-class passengers in the saving of life, 
Other conclusions of the American and British inquiry will eventually lead to several important changes and developments. In 1913, the first international conference on the safety of life at Seafarer was held in London. Thirteen nations agreed on a number of issues concerning ship design, including the principle of boats for everyone. All ships will carry enough lifeboats for everyone on board, and there will be training for all crew and lifeboat procedures. And on ocean-going vessels, a lifeboat drill will be held at least once a week for both passengers and crew. Vessels will carry enough radio operators to manage 24-hour watch. In 1930, the International Air Force was created in Rumbai, in the United States, Texas, attended by all vessels shipping. In 1985, a Franco-scientific expedition led by Dr. Robert Ballard discovers the wreck of the Titanic. shoes you can see that where she might have laced them up in little high right. heels you know mother nature when uh, when bodies land on the ocean floor in the deep sea they remove the body right. Right? and what's left is their tombstone are their shoes And we heard the dreadful sound of people drowning, which was, oh, unbelievable. 